Shake my speaker. Shake my speaker. All righty, we're on form. Good evening, boys and girls. All righty, cool bananas. Okay, well, we are one minute ahead of schedule, so there's still people rocking up. So good evening. Welcome to this week, this week's talk, or well, bi-weekly talk on conservation and ecology and just concepts of those. Um, I'm covered in dog's chew marks at the moment. So on the subject of predators, we're going to be talking about lions, not dogs. Okay, so um, lion conservation is conservation. It's as simple as that because lion conservation is apex predator conservation. And it's, it's a challenging, challenging topic. And it's, um, it's got a lot of controversial views, uh, a lot of contradicting views, and um, there's no real answer. And um, I think we can just get off, off the bat and talk about predator conservation as a whole. And um, lions are the last remnant of big, big, big predators that pretty much dominated this planet until humans came along. And uh, almost everywhere humans have gone, predators as in large predators, we're not talking about genus and mongooses, we're talking about real big predators have been extirpated. There's very few areas where apex predators still reign that humans are around. And the simple truth of the matter is that humans and large predators just cannot coexist. We have opposing, we have opposing needs and we just cannot coexist. You cannot have lions and you cannot have tigers and leopards and wolves roaming around inhabited human areas. They just will not be tolerated. They're not like elephants, which you can kind of work around like they do in parts of Africa or in Asia. Um, and they're certainly not like rhinos where they're that rare, where they don't actually pose a problem to anybody that doesn't, that um, happens to bumble across them. And every now and again, there's an incident. The problem with apex predators is that sooner or later they start hunting us. And um, even if it's learned behavior, it very quickly becomes learned behavior because we're pretty easy to kill. We just don't realize how easy we are to kill. Um, so um, there will be more people joining this evening, but if you guys have questions or you want to interrupt and just say something by all means, because the purpose of these workshops is to actually share ideas and uh, not just to hear me hear the sound of my own voice. I mean, I do love the sound of my own voice, but uh, in all seriousness, the idea is for us all to learn. So people have things to contribute or things to question. Even if you think that I'm wrong, you say, Nick, that's bullshit. That's great because I like, I'd rather be challenged than not challenged because we don't progress with new ideas unless we challenge old ideas. So nothing is sacrosanct. If you disagree with me, say so, please. And I'd love to hear an opposing view. Um, so you're going back to predator conservation, as I said, it cannot coincide with human habitation. If you want to have predators, we need to fence them off. Um, the only areas that, that and the only areas where they haven't fenced off predators is simply because it hasn't been feasible. And areas that are vastly underpopulated or areas where the financial resources are not, it's just not viable financially to fence those areas off. I was in an area um, two to three, sorry, three years ago in the Masai Mara. And there was a village in the middle of the Masai Mara with kids going to school. And there's no fences between lions and humans. And it sounds like a perfect scenario because the animals just roam in, in and out of the village and the villagers take their, their goats and their cattle to go, out, to go out and graze and browse in the felt or in the bush. And it sounds magical. The problem is the amount of lions that are killed and the amount of humans that are killed in, in conflict, more so lions than humans. If one human gets killed, it ends up being 20, 30 lions being shot. So that's maybe, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but it's the, the, count, the counter response or the, 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 the counteraction to, to, to a human being killed by predators is massive overreaction. So predators are not tolerated where humans occur uh, in any large number. And whenever that we have an opportunity to, to, to board them out, either we lock ourselves in or we lock them out uh, or we lock them in. And uh, that creates a problem because most conservation areas, especially areas with humans, uh, have been denuded or depopulated of predators. And that creates massive ecological ramifications it has this whole knock-on effect and we try to simulate the activity of predators through culling and it has positives and it has negatives um positives is that we can have an, an environment that has the ecological benefit of predation 
in terms of controlling numbers. But what it doesn't control is the psychological impact of predators in an area. And that has a massive, massive impact. Um, so predators in particular, they, they keep other animals out. It's often been recorded that lions, sorry, um, elephants will avoid areas with populations of lions. They just don't like them. They will not always, but often, in fact, nine times out of 10, avoid an area with lions. So areas with lions tend to have different habitats to elephants simply by virtue of the fact that elephants will depopulate an area of large trees and turn more into shrub felt and bush felt. And areas with lions tend to start forming greater larger canopies and more healthier canopies if you want to think of it the word healthy because what's healthy in ecology um oh we're getting a whole bunch of people joining how cool is that and um yes sorry there's a question uh nick i've never understood how people who reside in those areas remain there i do understand that moving out is not always an option but they're always aware they're in the vicinity of predators blah blah okay uh or even the predator animals that may threaten them and crops feel like Yeah, a lot of these people are ancestral people. They've been there for thousands of years and they've just had to deal. There is no option. You know, us as white suburbanites, we can say, well, why don't you just go back to your house, go to your grandmother's in, in Santon? And we don't understand that there is no option B. You know, the guy lives off a dollar a day. <laughs> There's no option B. They have to live in those areas. And they don't live alongside the lions out of some holistic wilderness man living alongside nature nonsense humans don't live alongside nature we just don't we no matter what color we are we obliterate it um there's this myth about you know native people living alongside animals and uh, that doesn't apply the only reason why we live native people live live alongside animals is because of the low population numbers certainly not because of any holistic mindset towards conservation they may have and there's this very trendy woke approach to um to you know left-wing conservation where white man bad local native people very good do everything for conservation white man does done nothing good for conservation and it's it's total nonsense we're all humans we're all assholes and we all wipe out everything else wherever we go if you look at what occurred historically across the planet where anywhere humans have gone we've wiped them out so a lot of these people live in that area not because they're in love with nature it's just simply because they their ancestors migrated there thousands of years ago and that's where they've always been and they just don't have an option b to get out so uh that's why they remain there i mean if i was earning a dollar a day i certainly wouldn't be able to move to santon and just get a better place to stay <laughs> they uh you know south africa has had depending on how you look at it either the fortune or misfortune of having colonialism come in and terraform the area i mean we've completely changed the landscape of south africa i mean if you go out to Mpumalanga, it's all forestry that was all grass and bush felt 100 years ago and it's now just pine and gum tree plantations i mean that's it, you don't get that level of of monoculture occurring anywhere in southern africa or sub-saharan africa so south africa is a bit of an anomaly where we had we don't have these vast wildernesses that they have in namibia or kenya and you can easily get in line outside of a conservation area roaming around you know and they don't want to be none the wiser um it doesn't occur in south africa because our pop our, our conservation areas are minimal and they're these tiny little five thousand hectare little fenced in areas and but that is also one of the reasons why we have some of the highest levels of predators is because we can keep those predators away from human lion conflict or human predator conflict and um this is one of the reasons why cheetah numbers are the highest in south africa and i'm hopping a bit from lions to cheetahs but premises still apply that um the thing is what's kept cheetah numbers up in South Africa are fences. They haven't engaged in human areas. They've been kept away from human areas. They haven't hunted our cattle and they've been tolerated simply because they're behind a wall and they can't get out. In areas without those walls, without those fences, they roam, they attack cattle and they get killed. And so you'll find that in areas like Botswana and those areas, you know, the numbers of predators in those areas is comparably slow, um, slower, lower than you would find in South Africa. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that's just the way it goes because they don't have fences there and lions interfect, interfere with human populations and they end up getting killed. Here, lions don't as often interfere with humans and they don't end up getting killed. Um, the sad fact of the matter is that there's five lions in captivity for every lion in the wild. And they estimate that there's anything between 6,000 and 20,000 lions, uh, lions left in the wild. And that sounds like a lot, but it's not, considering that um, if you go back a couple hundred uh, years ago, you would have had tens of thousands of them roaming the plains of Africa. Now, I'm having a glass of wine. Now, um, 
Lion conservation isn't an intrinsically African thing. There are still vestigial populations of lions in India. Uh, there's about three or 400 uh, lions surviving. They are much smaller, not because they're a different species, but because of the fact that they've been persecuted by the hunting industry for hundreds of years, long before the Europeans arrived there. And again, much like we've experienced in South Africa, that dwarfism that's occurred through genetic manipula manipulation because we hunt out all the big ones. All their big males have been wiped out over generations and all that's left with these runts. And that's what's happened in India. So the average lion there is not topping more than 120 kilograms, where you know a male should be at least 180 to 230 kilograms, but their male is 120. So he's a little dwarf by comparison. And um, lions used to roam from the tip of Africa right to the top of Africa, through the Mediterranean, right through to Spain, through Italy, through southern France, all the way through the, Mid the Middle East, right through to China, right through the, 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 the Bering Straits and into North America. That was their ancestral distribution range. And around 9,000 years ago, humans started really spreading out and really doing well and gradually wiped out lions all those areas. Until about um, 1,000 years ago, there were still lions in Greece uh, and there were still lions there were rumors of lions in Spain, but no guaranteed records. Uh, but there were lions in Greece. There were still lions in the Middle East a thousand years ago. And those have all been wiped out. Um, now, lions have been gradually pushed further and further and further south into the more and more and more isolated areas. Wherever civilization has occurred, lions have been wiped out. So they cannot coexist along human populations of any density. If you'd go one or two rural people running around in, the, in, in really desolate areas, lions can survive but they cannot coexist alongside humans simply because their needs and our needs clash. What they need, they need to roam, they need large territories, and they need extensive populations of wildlife to support them. And they are also very territorial and they tend to be kicked out of territories by other males. And so they need to find a new territory. So if, even if they're in an area that's off limits to humans, if a male gets kicked out of that area by another male, he'll go roam into an area with humans and he'll try his luck in him getting killed. Um, so, Lion conservation, unfortunately, means blocking them away from people and really trying to find refuge for them from wherever we go or limiting where we go and say, sorry, you just can't develop there and cordon that area off and not allowing humans. And that seems to be more or less the policy to any big animal conservation, just blocking away from people and just saying, you know, sorry, that area is off limits. You're not allowed to go there anymore. That's why the Kruger National has had such sterling success again, open to interpretation, but all around compared to the rest of South Africa, Kruger National is a booming success in terms of its conservation efforts. There are flaws, like everything, but uh, the fact is that you won't see a single lion on the half felt uh, anywhere, except for maybe in a zoo, and you'll see thousands of lions roaming the Kruger National, indicates the fact that, predator, that, that the conservation efforts of the Kruger National work by simply keeping people out of those areas, historically because they just weren't inhabitable for people because of disease, and harsh conditions. And now we simply have a fence saying, "Tot sense, you can't go in there. And that's what's protecting them. And, um, but lions, you know, they have, as I said, much like wolves, they have a very important ecological role in psychological denial of areas. They keep animals out of areas. And that is so important for habitat creation. You need this mosaic pattern of habitats. And elephants tend to be like bulldozers. They smash up habitats and they create really, 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 bushy scrubby habitats that don't provide any homes for, uh, for for or provide homes for a lot of smaller birds and you know bushveld loving birds but forest canopies and um, woodland canopies tend to form in areas where elephants are not going into and those are often areas with lions so on a big five reserve lions play an important role and on many reserves they are not given the protection that they actually uh, the, the the numbers they really deserve um and there's a lot of reserves that are very apprehensive of lions. Um, the former reserve that I used to work at had lions and um, the, the um, Pongola game reserve also had lions. And uh, sorry, didn't have lions, didn't have lions. Um, and their whole mindset was, well, we don't want it because it inconveniences tourists. And to be bluntly honest, uh, you are, and I'm gonna say this bluntly, you are fucking up <laughs> your ecosystem by, uh, by not having large predators. The knock on effects of that um, are whole scale. Firstly, you're not removing, um, you're not you're not creating that psychological denial that predators create, 
And on top of that, predators control your, your unhealthy populations, whereas culling a lot of the time comes from the hunting industry, which targets your healthy populations, your biggest uh, individuals, your trophy animals. So the argument of removing large predators out of an area and letting trophy hunting and culling take over the premise of that, it doesn't really work. Unless you've got a, a culling program that specifically emulates the behavior of lions or large predators like wolves, um, you're not going to have that, that same sort of benefit. So, and again, with, with um, the psychological aspect applies in the sense that animals will avoid human areas, but we're not going hanging out in thickets, you know, we're not creating woodland habitats, we're creating urbanization with the very less farm line, farmland habitats. So lions, um, yeah, they, they, they are sorely, un, um, they, they, they're given a lot of romance, they, they, they're appreciated, but um, a lot of reserves are very apprehensive to introduce them. The big problem as well is that lion numbers on the reserves that do have them are at capacity. This is the thing. Then lions are endangered, their numbers are dropping, but the problem is the reserves that do have them, especially in South Africa, are at capacity. So what do we do to increase their numbers? It's very difficult. A lot of reserves don't want them. Uh, the, the legislation and the laws behind introducing Big Five into a non-Big Five area is Firstly, extremely difficult. Um, if you know anything about getting an environmental management plan and predator plans, it is a nightmare to get it processed. And secondly, the 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 the, the criticisms and the, the backlash that you'll get from the farming communities around that reserve or from the community, the rural communities around the reserve, will often inhibit the introduction of large predators. So it's a question of human interests versus animal interests. And um, yes. Frankie, question. With conservation efforts in place, why is not more being done to put an end to can hunting? Because can hunting is a money industry and money has nothing to do with conservation. Um, it is purely a blood sport that generates inordinate sums of money. These hunters are paying 50,000 US dollars. That's 750,000 Rand to shoot a lion. A significant amount of money goes into the pockets of the guys that are processing these laws. And they're getting all their pockets lined and they just seem bank. And a lot of the guys in government that make these laws aren't conservationists. They're lawyers and bureaucrats and politicians and they don't give a crap about conservation. Um, you'll find that most people in conservation departments don't have any qualifications in the conservation department. Hell, our army is led by a preschool teacher. <laughs> what does she know about the military? You know, um, I mean, we'd like to think kids are a combat zone, but they haven't got a scratch on it. <laughs> So uh, Anton offers a question, an ethical statement and a question, because of the increasing human population and smaller conservations, can't some lions sacrifice their freedom for the survival of lion species through lion farming, interaction with lions and secure? That's a very valid point. But an ethical dilemma is, again, it's a sliding scale. On what on that ethical, on that ethical um, question, where do you draw the line? So lion petting, fair enough. That lion can never, ever, ever be reintroduced to the wild. You can never reintroduce a lion that's been, that's been read, raised with humans. Um, they just don't adapt. And um, I've heard contradictory arguments to that, but the official statements is they don't adapt after they've been introduced to humans. They don't rewild very well. Some people disagree. I'm just gonna go with the official rules for now. I don't know enough to really say yes or no. Uh, but so you can't breed lions and send them back into the wild. They either have to be fully wild or fully domesticated. There's no middle ground. Um, and um, so that's one of our biggest challenges that we really need to rethink um, the way that we start working with lions. Um, the trick is not to breed lions. We don't have a problem with, with breeding them. They, they breed like flies. They breed like cats. I mean, if you've ever had cats, you know how difficult it is to keep their numbers down. The only thing is spaying and neutering. They breed really, really well. In the wild, the survival rates are so low is what keep lion population checked, but they breed rapidly. A female can have one to two litters a year, uh, sometimes of two to four cubs, and um, under ideal circumstances, if they're all surviving, you're going to have up to two, up to four to eight cubs a year, every year for up to 10 years of the female's life. It's a lot of cubs that she's producing. What keeps those numbers down is the fact that maybe only two of those cubs will survive to adulthood out of their entire batches she'll have over her entire life. So that's what controls the numbers. So we don't have a problem getting lions in captivity. They'll breed like flies. We just can't introduce them. So we have to rely on wild populations. Now, the problem with wild populations is that everywhere that has got them, as I said, is at capacity. The reserves that have got lions are full. They've got no more space for lions. Most of their females are on contraceptives or the males have been neutered. Neutering is a huge problem. So they prefer to, uh, they prefer to put the females on contraceptives. 
Um, so you'll find that that having lions is a challenge because no one wants them. They're like rhinos. They're a bloody nightmare to take care of. They constantly escaping. Rhinos have the whole added issue of security. So no one wants rhinos because you need to have an entire battalion of anti-poaching units to defend them. South Africa doesn't really get hit with elephant poaching. Not really. There's, a, I think, about six elephants a year in the Kruger that get poached. Small numbers. They breed faster than that. So it's, it's an insignificant number, even though it's tragic. Lions don't get poached they, uh, to any great extent. Um, they do get poached, but not to a great extent. The biggest threat to lions habitat loss. They thrive. You just let them have their space and they thrive. As long as they've got food and they've got space, they don't need to be taken care of. There's no real threat to them beyond human conflict. Uh, they're not being hunted for for anything in particular, any great number. And often it's easier just to get domestic lions for the Chinese market and the Asian markets than it is to go get wild lions. So a lot of those lions that are being killed for the for the eastern markets are being killed out of um, out of breeding facilities. So they have no place in conservation. They're not a conservation goal. Captive bred lions aren't involved in conservation. They are zoos. Simple as that. They don't have a role. Uh, maybe for genetic. Um, for, for, for genetic uh, stock that could be important, like if you've got a white lion, even if he's domestic, he could still theoretically mate with a wild female lion and transfer those genes across But um, to, the, to the young, but um, he's not going to be able to be introduced. Um, now, a lot of people don't realize how few lions you can have. On an area of 6,000 hectares, so that's a substantial land mass, you can have maybe three lions. Three. That's it. You can have 20 to 30 elephants. Sorry, I'd say closer to 30 elephants. You can have three lions. That's it. Now, so bear in mind that a lion on average will take a kill every three to four days. Let's say optimistically an impala every three days. How many impalas is it over a year? It's 120 impalas a year. That's to support one lion. If you now, so if you've got an impala over his entire lifetime, let's just say a healthy male lives eight to 10 years, optimistically 10. It's 1,200 impalas to feed one male lion for his life. Because he's not, he's not gonna eat every scrap on that animal. He's gonna eat what he needs, leave what he doesn't need, and a couple of days later, he'll go and make a kill again. He'll binge himself, and then three to four later, days later, he'll go and eat again. So let's say optimistically, he's eating every three days. Over his life, he kills 1,200 impala just for him. Now you need to have a sustainable population of impala to firstly experience the loss of disease, drought, famines, uh, injuries, sicknesses, parasites, all those other things, the other predator issues, the conflict between other males, age, and then you still have all those factors and enough to breed, enough impalas to breed 1,200 impalas to feed their lion. <laughs> now you've got three lions, so you times it by three. Now suddenly you realize how many freaking animals you need on that reserve just to support three damn lions. It's an astronomical number and they tear through your populations. On top of that, when you start getting large numbers of lions, this is how you got a 50,000 hectare reserve like up in, in Popo and you've got coalitions of three to four males. They start hunting your buffaloes which have lower breeding rates and they'll tear through a small herd of buffalo in two to three years. You'll start off with 50 buffaloes within two years of 20 buffaloes. So that's the big problem. So reserves don't want to have big coalitions of males because they start hammering your populations of big animals like buffaloes and zebras, which are slower breeding and have slower reproductive rates and don't do as well. Something like an impala, which can pop out every year, has a far faster breeding rate than, than, than a buffalo, which is 16 months. So, um, you know, this is the problem. So reserves don't want buffaloes and lions to be on the same reserve. A lot of reserves simply say, we don't want any more lions. In fact, you'll find that when a female has males, uh, a female lion has male cubs. When those males come to about six months old, those reserves will shoot all the males and um, allow just for maybe one or two dominant males, never more than three, because when you start to get into three or four, they can start taking those coalitions of males can start taking buffaloes and they don't want that. Now, on a big reserve like out in the, in the Mass Amara, when you've got 300,000 hectares of wilderness, you know, your numbers are so large that you can sustain, your numbers of buffalo are so large that you can sustain those gargantuan populations of, of buffalo and you can still have the knock-on effect of lions. But in small 5,000 hectare reserves, you just can't. So a lot of reserves just really do not want to have lions. Uh, the tourism factor is one of the biggest reasons why people do want them, but the logistical nightmare of keeping a lion sustained, one lion, is a bloody nightmare. Um, and that's why a lions are 
are struggling because we are taking away wilderness areas throughout Central Africa. In South Africa, we're at capacity. We're done. There's nowhere else to put lines unless we open up new reserves and new big five reserves. So um, that's the thing. And we need to open up reserves down in the Cape. We need to, I mean, the Cape's got almost no real big five reserves. I know they say Aquila down in the Cape, but that's a joke. I'm sorry if anyone works at Aquila. Uh, it's, it's, it's a joke. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a zoo. Um, so no, that's not a big five reserve down in the Cape. You need actual wilderness reserves down in the Cape again. Uh, I think the, the closest they've got in the Cape where they could introduce lions would be De Hoop, which is 20,000 hectares. They've only got buffalo on De Hoop. They don't have any of the other big five and they really should introduce everything else, but um, they want to have those areas accessible to hikers. So they keep everything else off the radar. And again, the ecological effect of that is massive because those areas did historically rely on all the big five for their interactions. People often, often forget that elephants used to occur right down to the tip of the Cape, as a buffalo, as a rhino, as an elephant, they, as the lions and leopards, and leopards are still there. Um, so we really, really need to, to start opening up more reserves if you want to increase lion numbers and lion diversity. As I said, there's between five and six lions in captivity for every lion in the wild. And those lions in captivity will never short of mating them with a wild lion, never have a contribution to conservation. Um, likewise, there's actually quite a few different subspecies of lions. Uh, some of them have gone extinct in the last hundred years due to the hunting industries. Um, fun fact, we used to have a bear in Africa until 1879. It was called the Atlas bear. It was a native to Morocco and North Africa. The last ones were killed by trophy hunters. And so that's, um, yeah, and again, lions, uh, a lot of our subspecies of lions, like our subspecies of rhinos, have been wiped out by the trophy hunting industry. Wherever European hunters went, they just shot and shot and shot and shot and shot and shot until there was nothing left. Uh, like one hunter bragging about killing over the course of a month 1,700 hippos in the St. Lucia estuary and laughing about it. Um, so we, our biggest issues is protecting the genetic stocks that we have left and expanding that genetic stock. Those days of the hunting industry are for the most part over, purely because there's nothing left to hunt. Uh, there's no great wildernesses left. There's, uh, and the great wildernesses that are left, flawed as they are, are mostly protected, thankfully, mostly. So the animals in those areas, although they're lower in number because of the in conflict with humans, they are getting by in a holistic sense. Our South African reserves have canned hunting reserves, which are not conservation. We don't have to worry about them. They're zoos with guns. Um, but the real reserves are at capacity. And the only way to get lion numbers up is to increase the number of reserves. There's, because the reserves that don't want them are never going to want them. They just don't want them for, for the human conflict issue. You can't let hikers go on a hike when there's lions in the area. You just can't. And a lot of reserves rely on the tourism factor to keep going. Um, in fact, leopard conservation is very much a similar thing. A lot of reserves don't want to reintroduce leopards, even areas where leopards wouldn't be a threat to humans, purely because of the concerns with hikers. They have the same thing in the USA with mountain lions, which are not lions. They are cousins of cheetahs, fun fact. Um, so um, with the same issues, because mountain lions have on occasion taken humans, and now areas have gone to great lengths to remove lions to secure the safety of humans. So... This is the issue. Do you want to have a conservation area uh, without tourism or conservation area with tourism? The conservation area without tourism will get shut down and turned into a farm like that. So it's, um, these are some hard facts that we have to face. There is no easy solution. Does anyone have any questions before I go on? Um, I'm just going to finish this. I'm talking for an hour. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, one of the interesting things about lions, though, is that lions in many areas, especially in Europe, lions were further north historically um, than they are now. I'm gonna, sorry, just to back Nicole. Um, yeah, they, I honestly don't know. I, I don't know enough about the legislation. I don't think anything in South Africa is legal, illegal. It's kind of open to whoever's got the most money. So whether there was a decision or not, I doubt that it stopped anything. I mean, people are still hunting cheetahs and cheetahs are critically endangered. So, I mean, I see posters all the time, posts all the time of a guy having shot a cheetah, king cheetahs, no doubt on top of that. Um, so I don't think the, the candy hunting industry to play devil's advocate, to purely play devil's advocate, the can hunting industry has at the very least taken pressure, I'm not defending it before we jump the gun, 
has at the very least taken pressure off wild populations because guys are not going out to the bush and hunting wild populations. They can get that short dick fix uh, covered by going off to a reserve with a bread line and getting a shot, you know, so they can get that done for them. Um, so at the very least, the can hunting industry, which I'm not condoning, has done that if we want to look at the devil's advocate approach to the situation. Um, but um, so lion conservation, going back, I got distracted, sorry. <laughs> Lion conservation is, um, no, sorry, lion, uh, lion uh, habitats have actually receded in the last couple hundred thousand years. The lions existed all over the show. Uh, as I said, even North America until about 9,000 years ago. And what we've seen that there were actually several species of pack hunting cats, lions, panthera, leo being the last true pack hunting cat. There were quite a few species until fairly recently. And wherever wolves and dogs and canines have interfered, not through humans, we're talking about just natural expansion of canines, wolves and their cousins. They've actually outcompeted pack hunting cats. Pack hunting dogs are just better in every capacity than pack hunting cats. And they just do better. And everywhere the pack hunting dogs have thrived, lions just kind of have to call second, you know, take second place. And in Europe, they won that race. They push lions right down to the Mediterranean. They used to go further north. And lions used to go quite far into North America until fairly recently around 200, 300,000 years ago, when the wolves started invading North America and really actually pushed pressure to push them further down south. And there was a very you know, healthy population of lions around Arizona and those areas. I mean, it's crazy to think, but that was 9,000 years ago. And um, so, so predator conflict is a major aspect in, in, in um, uh, what do you call it, in, in the dispersal of populations as well. And lion and hyena conflict at the moment is a major war going on in Africa. No one really knows where the two are going to go because it's hard to say in the space of the 150 years of conservation, 130 years of conservation, where lions and hyenas are going. You know, we've created these artificial small ecosystems, so we can't really say who, which one's going to win the evolutionary arms race. But there's currently an arms race between pack hunting hyenas and pack hunting lions. One of them would win. Wolves have won most of the northern hemisphere. Lions were there. Uh, and they were pushed mostly to the warmer belts. And wolves have not gone, wolves have gone into North Africa, but they've not managed to outcompete lions further south. So there are wolves in North Africa and very small populations. And in those areas, lions have not managed to outcompete them. And they've gradually been extirpated through conflict with um, so well, through humans and also through wolves. And um, if you look at these same sort of themes recurring in history, the rise of lions outdid the rise of the, of the dog-like hyenas. Now, hyenas are not dogs. They're cousins of mongooses. I know, weird. Um, and ancestors are the descendants of civets, no less. And, um, but um, there used to be two groups of hyenas. They had the slopeback hyenas and the flatback hyenas. And the flatback hyenas dominated most of the Northern Hemisphere. And the rise of pack hunting cats, lions and their cousins outcompeted them. And then as the, 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 the flatback hyenas, the dog-like hyenas disappeared, the pack hunting cats came out further and further and further and further into the fall. And now with the wolves rising the last couple hundred thousand years, lions have disappeared. And then the last 10,000 years, humans have just kind of been the final nail in the coffin and um, driven lions pretty much everywhere where humans can occur, lions have not managed to occur. And unfortunately, there are high numbers of humans in areas where lions do really well, Africa being the exception. But the Mediterranean was chock full of lions and humans just wiped them out again, only around a thousand years ago, the last of them went extinct. So the biggest issue with lions is there is no way to have lions and humans coexisting. It just cannot happen. We have opposing views. It's like, radical Islam and radical Christianity, the Crusades, they just wipe each other out. They cannot coexist. So let's not ever try to have that holistic, well, let's have you know, eco suburbs with big five roaming around. We could have big four, but certainly not big five. Um, because eventually one day a lion will get a taste of human and the next thing you know, little Johnny is playing basketball and he takes a walk in the bush and goodbye Johnny. Uh, and then every lion in the reserve gets shot after that. Um, so, you know, we're never going to be able to do that. The only thing that we can do is, again, much like elephants, is creating an ongoing series, an ongoing mosaic throughout South Africa of small reserves, which help maintain a genetic diversity and actually help maintain some populations across the country. And again, if we ever get to the point where we actually start expanding habitats, we've got these populations dispersed across the country and we can widen our habitats and let those populations start linking up with each other. I mean, that's a pie in the sky dream, but you know, stranger things have happened. Um, you know, if you look back 60 years ago, you know, rhino numbers were 
you know, almost nothing. Um, and now they're recovering. So maybe in the future, who knows what will happen? Maybe we have this revolutionary thinking approach to conservation and we have massive tracts of lands that have been re-given back to, con to, to wilderness. Um, does it, um, we're gonna be wrapping up soon, guys. Is there any question? Any questions going on? Any statements, any contradictory opinions? I do so love them, so please pop in. Creek, 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 creek. <laughs> Frankie, you seem to be full of words. Anything to say? Nicole, Carol, Tez, Marty, Willie, anybody? Uh, okay, no, Willie says, thank you very much for an informative discussion, but cool, yeah. So we're gonna be, um, okay, no questions from anybody. And, um, but going back to the fact that we're actually a capped, a capacity, this is the reason why a reserves cull lions. Will a lion kill a water buck? Yes, absolutely. I've seen lions kill water buck. I've seen a cheetah kill a pregnant water buck and eat the mother and the and and the the the, the fetus inside. So it was actually a coalition of two male cheetahs. So um yeah there's no such thing as um oh, this animal won't eat that animals are hungry I'll eat freaking water buck if you give me the chance so I don't care how smelly it is. <laughs> so um yeah, I know the glands make the meat stink, but lions, when you're hungry, you're hungry. Remember, I'm, I've, you've seen lions that will pull a piece of meat that's literally turning into liquid of putridity. It's so rotten, and they'll just munch on that for days. Uh, I remember about four years ago, I came across a lion that actually um, was guarding a dead but, uh, not buffalo, a dead white rhino. Now, this rhino had been killed by an elephant in must, punched right through the stomach, thrown into the water, and um, had crawled back onto the land and died. And we thought it was a poaching incident when we discovered a rhino had been killed by an elephant. Nevertheless, uh, along, along came a young male lion and guarded this dead rhino for about 10 days and just kept eating off it, eating off it. This meat, I mean, you can imagine a rhino sitting in the sun, Africa, in the middle of summer for 10 days. It was covered in maggots. And this lion was just going to town on it. So if he's prepared to eat a decaying corpse that is just covered in maggots, a bit of stinky flesh is not going to be an issue for him. So you hear these old wife tales about water buck. Um, yeah, it's, it's pure nonsense. Uh, they will definitely eat water bug. Crocodiles, uh, leopards are a little bit more fussy. I can't say whether or not leopards will, but um, I know the lions and cheetahs don't give a crap. They eat anything. But yeah, um, we're going to wrap up on that note, guys, unless you have anything else to say. Um, any questions? A short and sweet explanation of why lion conservation is so challenging. Um, and yeah, as I said, the, with lions being a capacity, unfortunately, a lot of the time they have to shoot them if they've got cubs they just don't have anywhere to put them and that's the thing either those animals starve to death or they get shot those are the options so um we really have a hard time with lion conservation and the only solution is creating more reserves even small reserves if you have two two to three lions on a reserve it's better than nothing um and again we're not going to be able to put lines on reserves with people walking around because that's just never going to it's just never going to happen we're never going to tolerate that you cannot have lions and humans on the same habitat in the same reserves walking around unless you're a trails guard with a rifle um but you certainly couldn't have your average hiker walking around it's just not safe um but yeah on that note thank you very much i shall speak to you guys in two weeks time we shall be doing rhinos and uh, there's been a fair bit of interest regarding my snake classes being online i've had some people actually ask me if i can do it online so if people are interested in doing a snakes of southern africa comprehensive biology and id course to learn about the different families uh to learn we still haven't continued with our mammals from last year i need to get back on that but yeah if people are interested in doing a proper snake course not just learning your big five dangerous snakes cobras mambas blah 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 i mean but learning about your cool snouts your um you know shovel snouts all those sorts of things and um you know house snakes rock snakes you know various sorts of things burrowing asps whatnot we can do that in future as well but yeah i shall see you guys in two weeks for another conservation talk and we're going to get back onto our mammals and our reptiles in the near future all righty thank you very much guys adios